Thank you, Jeremy. Jeremy? My mother, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, we don't need the steps. I was joking. No, no, I was just kidding. Could you guys spread out a little bit more? <laughs> As Jerry was just alluding to, you started in 1986, was it six or seven, six? Yeah, 1986 sometime. Uh, I've been working at Paramount uh, doing situation comics. I did the last 20 episodes of Happy Days. I did a one camera show called The Powers of Matthew Starr. I don't know if anybody saw that. I was about three years ago. Mm, Sci-fi drama. More drama than but when, when you were brought on for Next Gen, did you did you did it feel like just another gig and you move on to something within a year, or did you realize this was going to be the beginning of something which ended up to be two decades of your life? No, I don't think anybody anybody that does what I do thinks that uh, you're, first of all you may not have another job, period, but uh, to have a job that lasts 18, 19 years, that's that's really unusual. No, I didn't have any sense of that. I, I was asked by uh, the head of the TV production um, to uh, meet John, uh, Gene Roddenberry, and I uh, had heard around the lot that uh, he was going to do another pilot. And that, uh, the studio didn't think much of it, but he had blackmailed them into the... the uh, you've heard this story before, I'm sure. Uh, he had blackmailed them by... Uh, telling them that he wouldn't give them permission to do Star Trek IV, which they knew was going to be a big box office hit because of the timeliness of the story about the whales. And uh, Roddenberry uh, had a clause in his contract that if they wanted to do a picture, they had to have his permission uh, to use the Star Trek franchise. And that um, in addition to that, they would have to give him a million dollars in order to make the picture without uh, his permission. Curiously enough, he never liked any of the Star Trek stories. <laughs> and he picked up his million dollars for all the, all the pictures that were made in spite of uh, his objections. Uh, but he did, uh, on Star Trek IV, add an additional uh, demand, and that was uh, that he be allowed to do another pilot. And uh, so they put up the money for the pilot, and they, they didn't really think it was, I don't think the people that were managing the studio knew that it was going to be what it turned out to be. But um, about halfway through the shooting the, uh, the first episode, uh, the pilot episode, um, they were looking at the, at the rushes, and they, I think, uh, made the right decision. They, they decided they would try to syndicate the show rather than try to sell it to the network. And um, I believe that was also a corporate decision that turned out to be a, uh, something that happened at the right time, you know, the right place at the right time. He, uh, uh, I don't think Roddenberry knew he was going to recreate, uh, you know, Tom Wolf's whole adage about you can't go home again, and, and uh, Dean, Kind of proved that that's not always not always the case. You can go home again if you do it right. And he invented some new things, you know. He, he, he invented the holodeck for one thing, and he brought uh, an android named Data to life. And that was uh, those two things alone, uh, coupled with his his uh, multiracial uh, ideas about casting and and how to throw the story to one character or another. And from one episode to another, that, that all made it work really well. But that had nothing to do with me being hired. <laughs> they, they, they had a couple of illustrators uh, working at Rick Sternbach and uh, Andy Probert. And uh, uh, I, I love both of them, but uh, they, uh, too, not to be too critical, but they both have their feet firmly planted in midair. They, they don't have a practical sense of what you sketch on the paper uh, gets to the screen with an actor in front of it. And that's what Mike Schoenberg, who was uh, in charge of production, wanted uh, when he hired me, when he, when he asked me to meet the team. 
When I met Gene, I, 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 was, I wasn't sure because of all that scuttlebutt on the lot that this wasn't going to be just another pilot and then they put it on the shelf and nothing would come of it. But uh, it turned out to be quite otherwise. And uh, it was, you know, lucky for me. <laughs> it was a, a long time. It three series and uh, six motion pictures. Um, speaking of those motion pictures, uh, you did five, six generations, first contact, insurrection, nemesis, and nemesis, right? Is that it? Right. Um, which one of those was the most challenging for you? And, and and I don't know if it's the same answer, but you know, which what are some of the, the which one are you the most proud of? What's your like? What's your favorite set? piece of production design that your, your team put together? Well, my, my, excuse me, my favorite set, I think, was the Klingon courtroom. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't get uh, photographed as well as uh, from Star Trek VI. From Star Trek VI, the undiscovered country, which is the one you missed. No, I missed insurrection. No. Anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, some of my favorite uh, sets are in this picture. Film you're going to see the uh, Romulan Senate uh, and the bridge of the Scimitar. And the uh, bridge of the Scimitar includes the Thalon uh, weapon that uh, is, sits in the uh, mezzanine area above um, the back of the bridge. And that, uh, that looks like it was done as a CGI um, enterprise. It wasn't, it was all in the camera. We actually built that flower out of steel that opens with the fatal Elon uh, energy stream comes out of it. Uh, all of that was done with real lighting and real uh, special effects, not uh, CGI. Um, the other, you know, every, every film has its challenges. All of them are difficult. Uh, None of them are uh, the same set of problems that you met the last time. So you, you, it's hard to even say, uh, I like this or I like that, uh, based on how difficult it was or how uh, proud you were of the result. Sometimes, as in the Klingon courtroom, the, the, the problem was we had 85 Klingons only, and we've got to make it look like there's 3,000 in this uh, at the auditorium, and we had to, just to make up 85 Klingons, and, and you had A, B, and C makeups too. You, when you got to the back row, those people were just wearing masks, basically. Uh, and uh, even so, 85 of those actors had to be started at 4.35 o'clock in the morning, and we might get all 85 together by 3 or 4 in the afternoon. So you had to you had to find a way to shoot around the fact that the crowd, which is instrumental in, in uh, playing the scene, uh, you had to be able to shoot the rest of the scene and make it seem as though, uh, so I built it a 10 foot high wall all the way around uh, the, the primary action and then put the judge up on a, on a platform in a, in virtually in a hole so that you couldn't see his face until the director wanted to see his face. And, uh, and so we, we did all the principal photography that um, with the, with the uh, main actors, uh, you know, say from seven till three in the afternoon, and then we, we got the crowd and we were able to tie them into the crowd scenes, and we'd move them from one place to the other. But the, the set itself was real. It was built uh, exactly as the scale looks on it on the screen with the exception of not being you know, 150 feet high. That was a, a, a one of the two, I think, uh, CGI shots that we did for the courtroom. But everything else was done in the camera by judiciously picking where the camera and the actors and the extras were uh, in relation to each other. Um, yeah. 